This podcast has been brought to you by Apologies. Gomen nasai. Aziv. Pardon. Baljan. Lo siento. Estur uns leid. Unskill. Basically, I'm sorry for the delays we've been having recently. And if Google Translate has steered me wrong. And if I've butchered the pronunciation. And for the game being messed up so my audio doesn't sound good for half the episode. And if any of those things have happened, let's just uh, settle on a universal apology. Oops. Hello and welcome to Monkey Broadcast, our monthly review and discussion show, most of the time, with me, the Johnny Monkey. And me, Sven the Crusader. Guess who's back? Back again? <laughs> The monkeys uh, are back. Tell a friend. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, I, once again, I apologize, but if you missed the update video, basically what happened was we completely missed the deadline. Well, that's not entirely true. I completely missed the deadline due to a l- due to being buried under work and having a lot of body difficulties, including RSI, which, yay. So, uh... In other words... It was one of those times whenever all of the fates conspired against one person. Basically just to ensure that our perfectly maintained monthly schedule for the last three years was finally brought to an end. Oh god, it's like The Undertaker's streak except almost sadder. Yeah, unfortunately. So, to make up for it, especially since that same business has meant that we haven't had the time to prepare a full review... We are going to do a feature-length Q&A session. Through the magic of time-warping abilities, continuum shift, wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey, whatever you want to call it, we are going to play the Q&A session that would have gone out last month, and then we will follow it up with a new batch of questions from this month. So without further ado, take it away, past me. Q&A! This is the section where we answer questions from the audience. If you'd like us to answer your questions, either leave them in the comments, or send them to me via Twitter with the hashtag MBQuestion. Our first question comes from IZ. Have you seen slash read slash heard of My Hero Academia? I've heard of it, but this is a Jonin question. (laughs) Yeah, I'm surprised this question hasn't come up before, actually, given how popular it is. For those who don't know, My Hero Academia is a shounen show. It's basically about... Well, long and short of it, it's a superhero school, and the hero is an underdog named Deku, who was born without superpowers, but then gains a kind of... The best way to describe it is a hand-me-down superpower. Like, it's called One for All, and it's passed down from one generation of superheroes to another, if that makes any sense. That's pretty much all I can say about the premise without spoiling it, but I've been reading the manga pretty much religiously as soon as I subscribed to Shonen Jump, and... uh, I've been checking out bits and pieces of the anime here and there, mainly the dub, because, oh my god, the dub for this is insanely good, like, really, really good. Color me intrigued. I mean, just to get Sven even more intrigued, Deku's mentor, All Might, who is this big, imposing Superman-esque figure, who is also, this is his official title in the manga, the world symbol of peace and justice, he's voiced by Chris Sabat. (laughs) <laughs> that seems like an oxymoron. <laughs> this peace and justice has been passed down the Armstrong line for generations. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a slightly more heroic version of his Armstrong voice, but my god, does he deliver, especially when uh, he gets to, into some of his more emotional battles. Just, oh man, that guy's so good. <laughs> and it's not Justin Chris but Justin Briner plays an excellent Deku and Clifton Chapping as Bakugo as well. Man, they're so good. <laughs> Should also explain, Bakugo is the rival for Deku, and uh, I really love him as a character just because, well, partially the development he's going through, which I won't get into due to spoilers, but also because he starts off as this really crazed, bully like figure with a short fuse, and that's almost a sort of deliberate pun because his superpower is that, it's gonna sound weird, but stay with me. He sweats nitroglycerin. Basically, he can make explosions at will. Wow. I'm just trying to imagine that guy in the Crash Bandicoot games. <laughs> Countless memories of running into a nitro box and going all the way back to the start of the level. Anyway, carry on. 
Uh, that actually kind of reminds me of that one minecart level from Sonic Lost World. Ugh. But anyway, um, <laughs> I'm really glad they put the effort into getting two good actors, because honestly, I think this is one of my favourite Shonen rivalries ever. In fact, I will go out and say it, Deku and Bakugo are what Naruto and Sasuke should have been, as far as I'm concerned. That's how much I really like this bearing. Like, Color me intrigued. Yeah, I mean, again, I can't go into too much spoilers. Like, for the record, this is why I haven't talked about Hero Academia too much, partially because it's still an ongoing series, and it seems kind of pointless to review it, for lack of a better term, because, well, I don't know where the series is going, and... I'm really hoping it doesn't have the decline in quality that, say, Naruto or Bleach had. Yeah, I mean, I believe it's been going on for a good length of time now, and the quality is kept up, which is a good sign. But after Bleach hit unprecedented heights with the Soul Society arc and then plumbed unprecedented depths afterward, <laughs> I'm very hesitant to trust shonen manga. Yeah, so that's part of the reason why I haven't reviewed it, but also because... Well, the internet seems really jumpy about spoilers lately, and a lot of the stuff I want to talk about its amazing development has already happened in the manga, but the anime is still ongoing, because they've actually taken a far more reasonable approach to the adaptation than the Naruto and Bleach anime did, which is they've divided the story into seasonal blocks, so they get up to the end of one arc, call it the end of a season, take a break, and then get back to the rest of the episodes later, giving them time to, you know, animate bed the scenes and not have to come up with crappy filler on the fly. But, yeah, again, like I said, I hesitate to trust Shonen after the dips in quality I've seen in the past, but that's an excellent start. Yeah. That intrigues me. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed it so far, just because it feels like it's hitting all the right beats of shonen manga and it is yet to dip as of yet because yeah it's over the top i mean it's shonen what do you expect but it has a wide cast of characters some of them are given a bit more development than others but they're still given their own time to shine and they all have pretty unique powers like some of them are just the standard i can control fire and ice or i can fly that kind of thing but then you get some really crazy ones like Ida has jet engines that appear out of his legs. Nice. Froppy has the abilities of a frog, because why not? And, um... I just hope that he has all the abilities of a frog without the uh, lethal weakness of crossing streets. Uh, <laughs> it's she, and that hasn't appeared just yet. Um, <laughs> Good. We don't want a frog or crossover. Yeah. And one I think you might I like, Sven... <laughs> Oh boy. Jiro, or as she eventually calls herself, Earphone Jack, who... <laughs> <laughs> she has these, essentially, sound jacks that come out of her ears, which generate sound vibrations, which she can plug into speakers, which she's placed into her feet. I'm not kidding about... What? <laughs> what? Oh, and she comes from a family of rock musicians. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that is an unprecedentedly unique way of playing with that trope. Uh -huh. This is a show that has high drama, but it doesn't take itself too seriously, and you can have fun with the characters. Whilst there have been like serious supervillain attempts, it also hasn't lost sight of the fact that it's set in a school like Naruto did, so it still has some of my favorite elements from the tuned exam arcs, where they're occasionally... Uh, presented strange challenges and they have to find unique ways to overcome it as opposed to just fight each other which again it's a small touch but it's one thing I really like <laughs> all in all My Hero Academia is a really great shonen series I thoroughly recommend checking it out there are multiple ways of doing it you can either keep up with the manga legally through Shonen Jump's manga app meanwhile Funimation simulcast the dub on their website and Crunchyroll has the Japanese sub version if you're one of those people read it watch it I don't care just if you like Shonen you owe it to yourself that may just cut through my fear of ever watching Shonen again yeah I would definitely recommend that at least I don't think there are many other Shonen I can recommend because uh, many of them uh, yeah, but yeah, My Hero Academia, I can safely recommend to you, Sven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and I are forever in agreement on that point, but hey, it's something for me to check out. Yeah. 
I mean, there is food wars, but that only... Uh, only if you're willing to not take fan service too seriously, let's put it that way. Um... <laughs> Well, if I was ever going to subject myself to it again, I would prefer it done the way Food Wars does it and not the way Tite Kubo did it. There is a reason he was always called Titty Kubo. Uh. You know, it's it's funny. Tite Kubo had all the gratuitous sexual implications of Ron Jeremy and all the writing talent of Ron Jeremy. <laughs> anyway, Inferno Zero's second question is, if you guys ever had the opportunity to make a movie, what kind of movie would you make? I'll just leave this here without context. Sci-fi steampunk western. Jonan knows why. Yeah, I know why. I mean, I would kind of say I'm limiting myself to not talking about series as such, maybe because, well, I've mentioned occasionally that I do freelance work, but I've not really mentioned what it is. I'm kind of a freelance filmmaker already, like a freelance cameraman and editor, and I went to university course to learn about film and animation, so it's kind of my thing. I've been desperately trying to get into the filmmaking industry and make my own films for a while now. Yeah, and to be fair, you have a much stronger chance of doing that than I ever theoretically will. Literally, my only filmmaking credit is knowing you. <laughs> but, yeah, not sure of it is, the type of films I would want to make... Oh, God, there were so many. I mean... Just to uh, throw some random examples out there, a martial arts sci-fi film, like a kind of sort of Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee style thing, except you've got aliens in it. Kind of like a, a strange cross between Way of the Dragon and Mass Effect, for lack of a better term. <laughs> that's, that's the most amazing descriptor I've ever heard. <laughs> That's one thing I would like to make. I've also thought of some strange short films like a... Let me pitch this to you. A man wakes up one day and he opens the door to see himself standing there. And whilst he's looking confused, the other guy goes, Hello there, I'm from the future. Fancy a card game? (laughs) That would be me coming in from the future. (laughs) Yeah, and there's more going on from there, but yeah, that's the initial premise of it. (laughs) Another thing I'd like to do is, this will absolutely never happen, because unlike a certain bunch of people who want to try and remake a certain Star Wars movie, I know my limits, but um, (laughs) one thing that I would absolutely love to do is make a Legend of Zelda movie, but have it so that rather than giving Link a voice and then having people react to it, I just make Link mute, not just have it so that he doesn't speak. No, I mean make him actually physically mute and make that part of his character as the world, and also the way he interacts with the world. And part of the reason why he gets teamed up with Zelda is that the opening scene I have is that Princess Zelda is just visiting the um, soldiers' barracks. She sees Link in a sparring match and he's easily owning several soldiers. And she asks, "Why isn't that guy promoted to general already?" And the soldiers casually respond. Well, the thing is, he's mute, so he can't really give out orders. Man, that is cool. So, Zelda decides to appoint him personal bodyguard, and that leads into the and Legend of Zelda quest. And then Ganon happens. Yeah, basically. But the reason I haven't committed myself to fully writing that yet is because I have a ton of original story ideas, and, well, sadly, let's face it, Nintendo is not going to give me the rights to make that movie anytime soon. If ever. But who knows, maybe later down the line, because Zelda is going to be here after humanity dies. <laughs> Let me just send a script to someone, but yeah, who knows? <laughs> In the meantime, for a serious answer on my part, I'm not going to go into too much depth about it, because I may still end up writing it, and who knows, it? there may actually be a space and time where it becomes a reality in terms of a visual media, but I've been sitting on... Well, let's say a major project for the last four years or so. Because I'm a buff for sci-fi and war stories and social commentary. I think I know which project you're talking about and that I'm already intrigued. I didn't realize you were thinking of making that movie, dude. (laughs) Yeah, and you were the one who suggested the title for that. But currently, because my ADHD ass sucks at everything to do with focusing on writing, there is no actual script. Just, you know... Only darkness. <laughs> he he. Uh, fair enough. Admittedly, this is kind of the state of a lot of my ideas. Well, that aside from being busy, it's also just... Well, I can't remember who said it, but basically the gist is... 
ideas and concepts are cheap. The proof of the pudding is if you can actually focus and turn it into a real thing. And admittedly, that's kind of my problem is that I get so many ideas for... Well, I get so many ideas of stuff and I lose focus on it. I mean, in terms of series, we've already got several potential ones, including multiple fantasy series I'd like to do. There's one uh, wrestling slash Shonen Metal series I was thinking of starting up and even including Richard in that one. I would know. I wrote a German for it. What a phrase. <laughs> Indeed. And I think you actually you wrote many characters for that one. And then there's also a martial arts series. There's a lot of stuff kicking around is what I'm saying. Yeah, and I mean, same on my end. My my attention sort of flits infinitely between about a billion different ideas. Except lately, my attention has been hyper-focused on a certain tabletop campaign, with which Jonan is very familiar. That is true. In fact, actually, that's another thing as well. I've also been uh, super hyped for running both the Curse of Strahd on MVL's channel and thinking of the campaign afterwards where I want to start putting some more original ideas and settings into it, so... That's the thing with really any tabletop medium. It is so much easier to write those ideas down because you have other people relying on you and also driving your story, which is great if you're a lazy parker like me. <laughs> Indeed, it, that is a nice bit of interaction in there. But yeah, those are all of my answers. And actually, one idea that I was thinking that if I did do this, I'd do it as a, a bunch of short movies rather than a series because I don't know if it'd have enough traction. Basically, imagine this. Kaiju with a human soul. <laughs> Eat your heart out, Godzilla. <laughs> yeah, that's one, one idea for a premise I had. But yeah. One thing that might help you focus, if any of those ideas sounded cool to you and you wanted to see it, please leave a note in the comment section, because I'm going to be honest, that's something I want to start moving towards making for the channel, like more original story series like that. But uh, yeah, moving on to our next question. Okay, our next question comes from MVL and it reads, Given that God is infinite and the universe is also infinite, would you like a toasted tea cake? No thank you, I prefer crumpets. I mean, personally, I'm, uh, call me American, but I'm an Oreo man. Also, MVL, what happened to you, man? <laughs> you're, you're typically so sensible it's painful. Unless, of course, you're murdering civilians. <laughs> well, I think it's either that or he's uh, spending too much time with one toaster. But anyway. Um... <laughs> Bow chicka honk honk. <laughs> no, no, not like that, not like that. <laughs> oh god, MVL, I'm so sorry. Please don't kill my character in D&D. <laughs> <laughs> As was once said at Adventure Time, hmm, toasted buns. Oh, God. Um, if anything, I'm the one who's gonna die now. Ugh. The irony is, it's actually referencing something a lot more innocent, you twisted son of a bitch. Anyway, um, I can ruin everything. <laughs> I'm like George Lucas. <laughs> oh, jeez. And before anyone types in, yes, I know what the reference is. You, you don't need to tell me. Anyway, our second question from MVL reads, uh, Pikachu or Eevee? Most people I've asked said that they'll be getting both, but since they'll be probably uh, forty nine ninety five each and may get ultra versions down the line, I'll probably get one. And Eevee looks cuter. Basically what that guy said. <laughs> also, Pikachu is establishment and I'm nothing if not a rebel. <laughs> what a phrase. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. For those of you who don't know, this is referring to uh, the latest Pokemon get names that were announced. Let's go Pikachu and let's go Eevee, which... Honestly, I have mixed feeds about, because on the one hand, I'm always up for more Pokemon. On the other hand, it's a 3D remake of Pokemon Yellow, essentially. Because they're doing that whole thing where either Pikachu or Eevee, depending on which game you pick up, is outside their Pokeball and follows you around throughout the entire journey. Yeah, and if that's the case, I would much prefer to be looking at, e at an Eeveelution the entire game, because I'm not really that big of a fan of the Pikachu line. Plus, it's Eevee, and I am a sucker eternally for floofy things. <laughs> That's a scientific term, folks. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I probably uh, lean towards Eevee as well, just because... I mean, I actually do like the Pikachu line, especially poor Raichu, who almost never gets used by anyone, but... Um... Look, Raichu is so much cooler, man. But yeah, if it's anything like Pokemon Yellow, I have this horrible feeling that they're not gonna allow you to evolve the Pokemon. And if that's the case, I love the Eevee evolutions, but Eevee on its own is kind of naff, to be honest. Okay, you make a fair point. 
However, I hope that they're not going to repeat that critical mistake, because otherwise, what is the gameplay purpose of giving someone an Eevee? Um, adorableness? I mean, basically, because you can't fight with the damn thing unless it's Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, in which case Eevee is insane. (laughs) Oh, I did not know about that. God, I play Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Time, I think it was, or was it Explorers of Sky? One of the Explorers games, and my Eevee had such high had such high attacks that I was just watching an infinite roll of insta kills and criticals. Wow. I mean when I tried playing that game, I picked up well that game and there was I only made it so far, but I got really tired of the RNG BS and just stopped. The only game I've been able to complete is Gator Infinity, and although I liked it overall, people have been continuously telling me that was the worst one. I mean, I have not personally played it, and I'm probably just gonna stick to Explorers of Sky, but... I mean, I can get why someone wouldn't like the game. It is basically just a top-down version of Dark Cloud 2, except more annoying. I mean, I didn't buy the battle system too much, it was just the whole thing of, oh, you failed the boss? Well, congratulations, you go back to the dungeon. Are you gonna make it through this floor? Who knows, because we just randomly generate enemies, some of which are completely out of your league. Have fun, kid! Mm Mm-hmm. Luckily, because I'm a sneaky snake, I played it on an emulator and I had safe states. Oh, god, that's probably the only way you can play it, in fairness. I mean, um, um... I would have gone insane otherwise. But yeah, a short version of the original question, I would probably pick up Eevee unless the evolution is locked, in which case I'll probably pick up Pikachu. Yeah, I'm torn now. If the evolution's locked, there's literally no reason to use Eevee, except I prefer the aesthetic and I am at this point irritated by Pikachu and the the entirety of the Pokemon anime merchandising, but that's another story for another time. Yeah, I do agree with you on that front. I also find it kind of obnoxious that literally every other Pokemon is allowed to use their animalistic cries, which I personally prefer, but Pikachu has to say its own name because of branding. It just is really jarring every time you pick one up in game now. (laughs) Also, on another side note, people are annoyed that this game is connected to Pokemon Go and is much simpler because of it, to which I say, well, yeah, of course. Pokemon Go made Nintendo a crazy amount of money and recognition. Of course they were going to link back to it eventually. It just sort of makes sense from a marketing standpoint. And hey, there are mainline games next year, so who knows? Maybe that'll be more of the experience you're looking for. Our next question comes from the illustrious Toon Junkie. I'm trying to build an exotic amusement park, but I'm undecided on what attractions to have. Should I have hangout monsters that eat people that are locked in poorly secured cages, or should I get some of those cursed amusement park rides that send children through dangerous portals? You know, the kind that teaches kids valuable life lessons through life-threatening situations. So, basically, what you're saying is you are torn between Jurassic Park and the Saw films. For the second example, I was actually thinking of that 80s Dungeons and Dragons cartoon where uh, kids enter the Dungeons and Dragons line and we're just dumped into the fantasy world. Yeah. Oh, actually, better comparison. You're torn between Jurassic Park and Willy Wonka. <laughs> actually, yeah, that would make sense as well. Although, I will say to Junkie, if you do go with the second one, and it's maybe probably the best because I don't like the idea of those terrifying monsters getting out. Um... All I will say is, make sure you have enough budget to see the series through so that the kids do get back home and are just left in the fantasy world for all eternity with no way to get home. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. I don't like the idea of those monsters getting out and us, you know, having to recruit Vincent D'Onofrio to be a military asshole about it. <laughs> Data Jurassic World reference. <laughs> yeah, I mean... No, it are like it's his fault that the monsters are super scary in the first place. <laughs> That's, that seems to be the running theme. Yeah. I've now got this image of a security guard going, Why the hell did you give it laser eyes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, if there's one thing that I've learned from both Jurassic World and Full Metal Jacket, it is that Vincent D'Onofrio always ruins everything. <laughs> there's a quote for this podcast. <laughs> But yeah, I believe that answers that question. Actually, on a side note, thinking back to that 80s cartoon, it's really weird how the perception of D&D has changed over time. God, no kidding. 
Although, mind you, it was the 80s where, for some weird reason, they were making child-friendly cartoons of literally everything. I mean, there was a Highlander cartoon, there was a James Bond cartoon, I think there was even a Robocop cartoon at one point. There was also a really, really animated version of The Hobbit. And Return of the King. Oh yeah, there was that too. <laughs> I mean, I think the Lord of the Rings movies are uh, sort of cheese, but... They're gold. They're absolute gold compared to those animated movies. Yeah, the Hobbit movies, maybe not so much. But anyway, our final question from Toot Toot Junkie this month is... Having won the great interplanetary hot air balloon race, setting a galactic record in doing so, can we expect an encore performance this year to defend your title? I would, but what can I say? I'm in training to be an election judge, and I'm going to get my year's share of hot air. Yeah, plus uh, I'm under investigation. Can't talk about it, but um, apparently there's some question about whether or not a rocket booster is a legal adjustment to add to a hot air balloon. I thought it was on the right side of the rules, but apparently not. Man, I knew we shouldn't have trusted that Russian guy. Damn you, Putin. He would only give it to us if we had to stand next to him posing in muscle oil. It was really awkward, but anyway. <laughs> That's not really a life experience I'm keen to replicate. I was especially weirded out once it turned out we had to honor an official holiday in his name. Ugh, I think it was weird when Zangief showed up and they started flexing together. That's the part I'm trying to get out of my head. But anyway, <laughs> and then it got complicated when it turned out Putin Day clashed with Rusev Day. Just... Ugh. But, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, every day is Putin Day in Russia. Ha ha, dark comedy. Uh, yeah. So, moving swiftly on from that, thank you, everyone, for sending us your questions. As always, if you have any questions, no matter how, um, si no matter how serious or crazy they are, I think we've just proven that we will answer both to the best of our abilities. Um, <laughs> we... <laughs> Ah, then please leave them in the comment section. That's what it's there. Q A two. Or, uh, or if you prefer a, uh, if you prefer a more, you know, suiting name for the summer wrestling season, we'll just call this Questlemania. <laughs> Or would it be question slam? Oh, no, that doesn't work. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just move on to the first question, shall we? Our first new saga question comes from Luffy McDuck, who asks, With Broly getting a fourth Dragon Ball movie, do you think it's time to finish the trilogy for Freeze's cooler brother cooler? I know nothing about this, Jonan, take it away. <laughs> okay, so to... Kind of explained, a lot of Shadow and anime, Dragon Ball Z included, like to release what well, are uh, basically hour long filler movies, usually involving, oh hey, let's have our heroes fight a random villain who we're never gonna see again or ever canonically acknowledge. That sounds about right. There was that one Naruto movie where they fought ninjas in the snow, or that one Bleach movie where Hitsugaya supposedly fought a friend from his past and Strangely enough, never mentioned it again since. <laughs> oh, or that one Naruto movie, which I sort of liked, if not for its complete lack of relevance to anything canon, where they were in the desert and fought a villain named Shaba Daba. I wish I was kidding. <laughs> yeah, so as part of that, there were um, several what-if villains that were thrown around. One of them being Broly, who is basically Dragon Ball Z Hulk. If the Hulk had a slightly crappy backstory. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great way of describing him. His backstory is that he wants to brutally murder Goku because, I swear to God, they were born at the same time and Goku cried a lot and he sat next to him. That's it. Basically, Dragon Ball Gregor Clegane, everybody. That actually fits so well, it's not even funny. Um, <laughs> so... Recently, all of the movies from Battle of Gods onwards have been canon and personally written by Akira Toriyama. So <laughs> this latest movie is Akira Toriyama. <laughs> the, uh, the interview which explained why he chose Broly was, some people are saying that they wanted to see Broly again. People tell me that I designed him, but I couldn't really remember. So I decided to rework his concept and try to actually fit him canonically with the lore. 
So, essentially, this new movie is reintroducing Broly, but actually written by the creator of the series this time, and hopefully without the crying baby triggers. <laughs> <laughs> to paraphrase Yukoski, uh, we're rebooting this character's backstory, and this is to make him better. That is more or less what's happening. So with this in mind, a lot of people have also brought up Cooler, who, in the grand concept of filler movies, is... Hi, I am Frieza's brother, who was never mentioned by Frieza or his father, and never been seen again. Apart from one movie where he became the Borg. And it was not a good movie. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's a noodle incident I'm going to look into on my own time. Just to make it even weirder, it's because he joined with an object called, and I swear to god this is a canon name, the Big Getty Star. Hmm. That basically just sounds like Majin Buu named a star after Skeddy. Yeah, it's really weird, but um, that's the context of this question. Would we like to incorporate Cooler in canon? And honestly, I'm gonna say... No, not really. (laughs) Man, I never thought I would encounter a Dragon Ball character who sounds more useless than Broly. Well, it's more... It's one of those rings where people think he's so, um, pun unintended cool, but I don't get why, because it's basically Frieza if he was slightly less effeminate and has a weird mask when he transforms, but I... Never really got that, because that would imply that somehow his body naturally forms a mask. Uh, granted, Freeze's transformations don't really make that much biological sense anyway, but you get what I'm saying? So- uh, to be fair, that is a an accurate summary of the entire franchise. True. But, yeah, I don't really think there's a lot that Cooler can add. I mean, it might be nice to see him... I don't know, actually interact with Freezer because, funnily enough, that has never happened. That's really about it. I mean, let's be honest, he was only really introduced because Freezer died and therefore they needed someone Freezer like for our characters to face. So, yeah, that's my answer to that question. But I would like to thank you, Luffy McDuck, because, uh, well, he's actually sent us a boatload of questions that should keep us going for the rest of the year, which I missed because Skype wasn't working for me for a while. But um, to make up for it, I'm going to post the next two questions for him just because one of them is so short I can answer it in about a couple of seconds. First off, on a scale of 1 to 10, how high to you that King K. Rule was in Smash Brothers? 11. Okay, the next question from Luffy McDuck. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. And here I thought I was going to tip the scales at 10, but no. This one goes all the way to 11. We're yeah. like we're <laughs> like Dave Meltzer giving out 7-star ratings anyway. Luffy <laughs> uh, McDuck's actual question is... With Smash Bros. Ultimate being the ultimate game with every fighter ever in the series, should they just keep updating that game for the next 10 years or so? Short answer, yes. Long answer, yes. <laughs> I just sounded like Matt Hardy. Um, <laughs> I see potential for that game to almost have the staying power of Fallout New Vegas, where constant updates, in this case official rather than mods, make it playable for literal years. Yeah, I definitely think that would be the best way, even if you have to, like, port it onto whatever Nintendo's next home console is. Because, well, there are two things that kind of concern me for the series at the moment. One, how much more content can you fit onto one game? Because in the last Direct, where they announced both Simon Belmont, K. Rule, and Krom, they've also mentioned that, oh, by the way, we have over 100 stages. We have probably over 70 fighters now, if you include the Echo ones. We have over 1,000 music tracks in the entire game. And it, you're just staring at it like, dude, I don't think anyone ever asked for this. <laughs> like, don't get me wrong, it's awesome, all the tracks are in there and all, but... I don't remember people saying that they wanted every single stage and every single character. I think you're kind of going overboard at this point. (laughs) To be fair, Jonan, I think you underestimate the ridiculousness of Nintendo franchise nerds. It weren't for the fact that these people want literally everything in their game. 
the Flash game Smash Bros. Z would not exist. <laughs> that is true. It's also the reason why Moogen exists as well. But, yeah, my second reason is... I don't see a reason to make any more Smash Brothers games unless you were going to completely upend it with new mechanics. Like, if you decided to do Smash Bros. Tag Tournament, I mean, they have enough fighters for it at this stage, or add some completely new mechanic to it, I'm not sure what it would be, but basically, you would have to completely reinvent the game from the ground up in order to justify having a new game at this point. Because, honestly, I think we've reached a point where... Yeah, like Sven said, we can just have constant updates with new characters being announced in Season 1 or Season 2 DLC. Kind of like what they're doing with Street Fighter V Cross Tank Battle and, well, let's face it, any fighting game these days. Basically, unless they want to do this one last time, maybe give story mode a slightly less crappy send-off. Maybe add a creator wrestler mode where you can fight as someone with a dinosaur for a face. Unless they're going to do that, then <laughs> just constantly updating this game for the next few years would probably get a lot of mileage. I mean, I guess there is the uh, me fighter mode, but mine just may vary on that. Anyway, <laughs> that's Luffy McDuck's question, and considering we're in wibbly wobbly timey wimey land, this next question may surprise you. Oh my god, it makes sense. <laughs> what am I looking at? Uh, okay, our next surprisingly sapient question from Toon Junkie, of all people, reads, What's your favorite type of weapon slash adventurer class that you like to see in movies or video games? Man, we really are in Earth 2. Um, mm -hmm. that's a good question. I can answer this in the context of tabletop games very easily, but in terms of video games, it's a bit more difficult. Actually, no, it's not. Sniper. <laughs> I was gonna say, dude. <laughs> I was fucking with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Because, <laughs> yeah, I know that in stuff like Valkyria Chronicle, Sniper is always your favorite class for this type of thing. <laughs> what can I say? I subscribe to the Alex Armstrong School of Manliness. Like a true man's man, I like to face my enemies head-on, face-to-face, through a high-powered scope from the next town over. <laughs> Yeah, I can totally understand that. Ooh, it's kind of interesting, you know, my end, because I tend to fall into two categories. I mean, either in video games, I tend to be fans of the elemental magics, like the mages in Fire Emblem, the scholar archetype in Octopath Traveler, or um, characters that are kind of quick and fast. Just to give an example, the Swordmaster class in Fire Emblem, or um, the scouts in... Um, Valkyria Chronicles. Basically, I tend to like the speedy classes, and I tend to like classes that give me options. So that's kind of why I like magic users, or in the case of the tabletops like D&D, &D, I usually like playing mugs, just because you do have those options to be creative with your attacks if needs be. Yeah, and it's funny. I joke about snipers because they are what I play in, well, let's face it, every video game that is not <laughs> Dragon Age Inquisition. <laughs> uh, in, on, in tabletops, I like to branch out a bit more. Yes, it's fun to play Matt Mercer's Gunslinger class and indeed face your enemies from the next town over with a gigantic oh. fantasy musket. Uh, <laughs> but on the other hand, I have a deep affinity for clerics because I like being useful in every way possible all at once. Yeah, I could totally see that. I mean, actually, now that you've been also now, Dragon Age... In that series, for some reason, I started to prefer being Rain, so in the run of Dragon Age Origins that I was going to turn into a multi-part series before life got in the way, how many times have I said that, the character I had for that, she was like a full-on archer and was basically using all of the skills like, I forget what it's called, I think it's Pinning Shot, where you actually use the arrow to stop someone moving for a while, that kind of thing. So, I was playing Mage with her. In Dragon Age Inquisition, I was playing Mage the entire time, so I could buff my party members, heal, and then zap them with lightning, which was always fun. That's that cleric life. Except, in the context of cleric, add to that having 19 armor class and just standing on the front lines in front of, in front of your enemies, just looking at them and saying, Swim this bitch. 
<laughs> yeah, I should mention for those who don't play tabletop games, clerics are like white mages if they actually have a defense. In 5e D&D especially, if you play a war cleric or even a life cleric, you have access to heavy armor. And in that case, if you pair it with a shield, you can get max AC close to the start of your campaign. And whenever you're in that situation, your enemies typically have to roll like 15 just to stand a chance of hitting you. It's glorious. Like Bobby Roode. Indeed, yes. So, yeah, that's generally uh, the type of classes I like. Actually, there tends to be three types of classes. High range or high movement, basically something that allows me to hit the enemies before they can hit me. Or uh, something that's flashy with a lot of options, which is also why the campaign spends currently running. Even though I'm playing Barbarian and having fun with it, I'm often saying to him, Hey, can I uh, multiclass as this? Hey, how about if I multiclass as this? You know, just give me some options. Is there any way I can work this in? This is, uh... <laughs> It's exactly why, uh, in this campaign, his barbarian has ended up in a warlock-like pact with a wind spirit that literally gives him a stand from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ancestral Guardians. But yes. Um... <laughs> I consider myself a merciful DM, the sort of, uh, so long as it works in a way where I don't have to spend an entire day homebrewing, will allow his players to, to dive fully into the rule of cool. Just, let's be careful, otherwise he may he end up in the realms of absurd. <laughs> uh, I actually forest. get that joke. Yes, I was going to say, puffing forest for those who don't get it. Anyway. Uh, absurd. The French absurd. Uh, <laughs> Indeed. Toon Chunky's second sane question is... In Shining Resonance, you fight the forces of darkness as a J-pop band. It's got me thinking... What is the silliest way you have ever fought the forces of evil? <laughs> well, if you don't count that one time in one of our 5e campaigns where I fought the forces of evil as Sir Wackwin for Elkis. Spoilers, dude! But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, re re reverse the sentence that I just said. Okay. Um... I actually played that game uh, very recently, in fact, by Rental. Unfortunately, despite the trailer making it look so cool, I mean, Tomb Junkie, you missed out the part where um, it's a standard fantasy setting, except the super attacks are weapons becoming instruments. I mean, for crying out loud, there was a knight who has a sword and shield that can be used as a violin. No, I'm not joking about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh Unfortunately, the gameplay was kind of lackluster, as was the storytelling. But anyway... Um... Yeah, that's that's a shame. Speaking of ridiculous ways to fight evil in games that were fairly uh, lackluster, two words. Twing twang. Oh, oh god. Yeah. Heavenly sword sniping people in the crotch with a repeating crossbow. I spent <laughs> more time on that mini game than I did in any of the rest of the game. Ugh. <laughs> uh. I mean, back to the question at hand, I mean, I've always thought it was kind of ridiculous how in both Yu-Gi-Oh! and the first season of Beyblade, you were fighting to save the world using children's trading card games and children's spinning tops, respectively. That's fair, honestly. I mean, in fairness, it was part of the ridiculousness that made it so charming, especially when four kids gave it an ultra-serious soundtrack as well. <laughs> oh, man. That's true. Oh, I totally <laughs> forgot about that. There's a trope called taking the bad film seriously. This is taking the absurdity seriously. Yeah, basically. I mean, it was one of the last few serious Dubs 4 kids did before they went into their let's make everything goofy phase. <laughs> I can't really think of much else for that. I suppose if you took one of those cooking shows and started to make it the fate of the world in their hands as opposed to the fate of an institution like in Food Wars, but... <laughs> That's fair. If if we were uh, taking this question more generously, then Food Wars would probably top literally everything. True, but it's one of those things where, again, it's the, the fate of the world has to be at stake, not just one institution. Otherwise, uh, I'm sure there are multiple anime that could top this list, like that one badminton an anime that's been popular recently. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, they turned badminton into a sports anime. Oh man. Just the very thought of that is so ridiculous. It makes me happier in my life. Indeed. And in fact, I want to actually see it because of um, 
just because there's one clip I have seen of it, which out of context is hilarious. I actually want to see it in context to see if it is this overly dramatic. But the context presented, this girl sees uh, someone who beat her at badminton so brutally in primary school. And she reacts like she's just seen the person who murdered their parents after so many years. Like, she starts <laughs> hyperventilating and going... <laughs> <laughs> Anime, everybody. <laughs> Indeed. So, yes, we better move on. Our next question comes from Infertity Zero and... Oh, we're on the weird side of YouTube again, aren't we? Would either of you be interested in watching a fight between a six-armed, six-eyed girl that spits webbing and a guy that can manifest his shadow into the third dimension? Uh, if well written. Also, that is oddly specific. <laughs> yeah, like Sven said, it entirely depends on how it's written or how it's been booked. If just to say, just to take an absolutely random example, if the guy whose shadow is in the third dimension has been holding on to a championship for about, say, five years and has barely defended it, and this person, uh, this six-armed spider girl is someone that no one really likes and is being continuously uh, pushed into the limelight, even though it's been made pretty obvious she's really not got the knack for this. <laughs> 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 uh, not, not that we're referring to anyone in particular. No, no, not at all. <laughs> uh, what Jonan said. <laughs> and on that reference, we uh, bookend this by making the uh, last question of this session from Inverted to Zero, and he asks... Would you rather have all of your spoken dialogue come out of those Animal Crossing text boxes... Or have your inner monologues accompanied by the Ace Attorney beep de boops whatever you're thinking? As cool as the latter would be, I think the former would be hilarious because I've actually seen a certain superhero skit series a long time ago where one character was literally just text boxes, and it was hilarious. <laughs> yes, I am referencing something that Jonan knows. <laughs> Oh, so I think I made I think. Uh, that might be cool. The <laughs> thing is, Animal Crossing, you can occasionally add custom catchphrases that the animals are then forced to say, which I'm not entirely sure I would be okay with having to end a sentence with a random letter beyond my control, P.T. Pie. <laughs> okay, that's fair. And now I'm just imagining all of the ways I could go horribly. Like, I really don't want to end up ending all of my sentences with Roman Reigns. Believe that. <laughs> uh, I mean, at least uh, it'd be slightly annoying, but after a while, you could just sort of kind of accept like, the beat bobs there. I mean, it's kind of like in Phoenix Wright in a way. Eventually, you just sort of accept it as part of the general ambience, and you just completely forget that um, all of the text is going... Doo -doo 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 -doo. You're paying more attention to, say the kick-ass cornered theme. I was about to say, if the latter comes with a side of cornered, count me in, believe that. Oh god, it's spreading. <laughs> uh, I mean, admittedly, I might make things even more tense if it happens, say, when you're in the middle of an exam. <laughs> True enough, but hey, as long as cornered had a chance to start playing as you reach completion of the exam, that would be... Awesome! <laughs> now I'm sounding like The Miz. <laughs> My text boxes are glitching. One moment. <laughs> and then he handed it to the examiner and he was like, Oh no! <laughs> Over the top reaction. <laughs> start, start slamming his head against the wall like Manfred von Karma. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> so, yeah, Phoenix right all the way, personally. <laughs> You've talked me around to it. <laughs> I think that would be wonderful. <laughs> okay, I've driven this joke right into the dirt, so how about we move on? Indeed, yes. Thank you to everyone who sent us in the questions. Just keep them coming. They make for an entertaining show. And I figured double the questions was the best way to make up for the, let's face it, rocky year we've had so far. <laughs> yeah. It's been a busy month, so doing this and being given a healthy dose of insanity has been nice. Indeed. And now it's time to close off the show the way we always do. We have a healthy dose of... Quickfire Reviews! This is the section where we reviewed everything else we've read, watched, or played, but within the maximum time limit of 60 seconds. I'll get started with one thing that has been occupying my attention this month. 
Octopath Traveler, the new Square Enix RPG that's been released on the Nintendo Switch. I will definitely do a full review of this on Monkey Broadcast once I've completed the game, but basically, if you like RPGs, especially classic 16-bit era ones, for God's sake, buy it. It is freaking awesome. The combat is really well balanced with lots of options, the characters are all really likeable and engaging, especially with the fact that the story mode is entirely character-based and is really all the better for it. There's no fantasy techno battle to get in the way. And on top of it off, there is the art style, which they describe as 2D HD, which is essentially 16-bit era sprites, but in a 3D world and glorious 3D lighting. It's just, oh, it looks so gorgeous! Oh, and there's also a kick-ass soundtrack. So yeah, buy it. Duly noted. <laughs> I really like this game, can you tell? I sort of, sort of got that impression. <laughs> Just a little. Uh, this, this mug of tea I'm drinking. Mmm, lemony. I'm not at all stalling to try and remember what I actually wanted to quickfire review this month. Oh, dear. Um, okay then. Um, yeah, it's gone. Okay then. And since I already mentioned it... Shining Residence Refrain. As I mentioned earlier, it's a game that has a pretty cool concept, but unfortunately, as much as I wanted to get into it, it really wasn't that engaging. The combat is alright, not that great. And the cast, again, they were alright, it was just not that engaging. I mean, I get that the reluctant hero is a standard trope, but really, you're making this guy sound like he's whining over nothing, since he seems to be controlling the dragon power inside him pretty well. And in fact, it gets even less credible when you find out that A, the dragon power inside of him is actually from the dragon deity of goodness, and on top of that, it's that dragon that has to motivate him to do, oh, I don't know, anything. So, yeah, that's a reason why I'm not really that keen on this game. Although the opening and the fan system did make it look a lot more exciting than it turned out to be. Yeah, it's uh, it's really a shame that that game turned out to be lackluster because, man, the concept of the sword and shield violin. And, of course, the axe guitar because, get it, axe, ha 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 Fun. ha. <laughs> Uh, although to be fair, it probably says something about me that I actually approve of that pun. <laughs> anyway, I think I've I think I do have at least one thing to preemptively review because by the time that our next episode comes around, it'll be it'll have long come and gone, and there will be an entirely different show focused on it. SummerSlam 2018, because I've always wanted to see Finn Balor versus Baron Corbin round three to open the show. But hey, at least we're getting Brian versus the Miz. That is true, and in fact, we did actually have that really good uh, series of Paul Heyman promos after Brock Lesnar started choking the life out of him, so there's that. Oh, man. I can only hope that he goes to Roman and turns him heel by proxy, because that is the only way that Universal Champion Roman is going to be in any way interesting. Oh, you sweet summer children. If only you knew what we knew now. And, yeah, I can't think of anything else, so... That ends both the quickfire review section and indeed this very show. Once again, apologies for the delay and thank you for putting up with me, but I hope you enjoyed it regardless. <laughs> yeah, just generally, as I said in the intro, oops. <laughs> indeed. Until next time, I've been the Jedi Monkey. And I've been Sven the Crusader, baby. Damn it. Monkey Broadcast, a monthly review and discussion show hosted by the Jody Monkey and Sven the Crusader. If you feel that you've been the subject of slander or that your copyright has been misused, please PM me and I'll try and get round to fixing it as soon as possible. We also welcome any comments, be it feedback or your own viewpoints on any of the things we've discussed. Until next month, have fun kids! <laughs>